Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from around the world for this World Strategic Forum. We're so pleased that you're here for this discussion about managing in uncertain times. My name is Ryan Heath, and as you just heard, I work at Politico. Why is an Australian, Australian guy talking to you? I'm here because I do our global translations work. And it's so great to have with me now Barbara Humpton from Siemens and Becky Frankowitz from Manpower. Thanks to both of you for joining. Hello. Now, I'm, I might turn, turn to you first, Barbara, Barbara um, but it's the same double-barreled question for both of you. Uh, now, it's uh, now, it's obvious, obvious that, the that the coronavirus pandemic has dramatically, dramatically affected every single, every single industry around, around the world. How did that, How did that impact, impact your company, company early, early on? And then the, and then the, the follow-up the follow is, what, is, what have you had to change in the meantime as we've moved from urgent crisis into something that feels a bit more like the new normal? Yeah, great question, Ryan, and thank you. It's wonderful to be with you all today. You know, for those of you who aren't familiar with Siemens, let me just share that we are a business to society company. A lot of people ask the question, what in the world does that mean? Well, you've heard of B2C, business to consumer, B2B, business to business. We, in fact, are a business to society company. Siemens, for over 170 years, has been building critical infrastructure for the world and has been part of every industrial revolution. And so here in the U.S., uh, the, the footprint here is huge, as you heard in the introduction, and we've been here 160 years. So when the pandemic hit, we went to work. It was and, and, and service providers, technicians who helped keep the lights on, helped ensure we had adequate power and, and could support people as we made the transition to working remotely. And then it was Siemens employees who helped um, set up new hospitals. We had to add hospital capacity in hot zones all across the country. So when you look at what happened in New York or California, you realize that these folks who really were taking the risk and going to the front line, supporting those first responders, they really were making a difference. But even more than that, our manufacturing team went to work trying to figure out how to help makers of PPE uh, become more effective and efficient. What we learned right at the get-go was the most important thing was for us to set a framework. Our priorities were the safety of our employees, the overall health and safety of our business. And then right beyond that, as soon as we were sure that we were going to be okay, we went to work on things that would help others, things like um, inventing a new antibody test that would help us determine who either has had the virus and, you know, now we're going to roll it out. It'll be extremely helpful in working through public health issues. Ultimately, though, Ryan, you know, we're an organization of engineers. And what we needed was to keep everybody connected and I'll say busy, being helpful. There's nothing an engineer likes more than a good problem to solve. So this idea of stepping into action early on, working remotely where possible, but going on the front lines where needed, we then set a small team to work on looking across the horizon to make sure that we understood what might be changing due to the pandemic or the economic crisis, and now due to the overall societal issues that we're dealing with. So I've been so proud of the way Siemens has stepped up and responded. It's been, on the one hand, um, you know, at times terrifying, but on the other hand, exhilarating. Thanks so much, Barbara. Uh, speaking of the horizon, that is a great uh, way to go to Becky because Manpower deals with so many industries and I can't even imagine the number of challenges and problems and solutions you've been dealing with over the last six months, Becky. Uh, why don't you take it away with the same question? Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Um, so I'll first just say at Manpower Group, we exist to help people find meaningful and sustainable employment. Um, we were founded 70 years ago. That's what we do. And you can imagine when a crisis comes, um, that's had significant impact on a workplace shift. So we have seen the largest workforce shift since World War II in our country. Entire industries were frozen overnight, um, stopped hiring, and others accelerated. And we have this new term called essential. So we have essential and non-essential workers. So that's been an entire new framework um, to operate within. 
To give an example, I'll never forget, I received a call on a Thursday from one of the large um, hotel chains in our country, and we needed to shift 10,000 workers, 10,000 overnight. And they were people in the hospitality industry, and the hospitality industry was one of the frozen industries. So it's not like they were hiring. And so we had to help those, you know, th- those American workers recast themselves into new jobs. So it wasn't about the title that they had in the hotel industry. It's about the skill that they had and how we could recast that skill into grocery retail, as an example, that was hiring. And so we, we saw significant shift in um, demand and an increase in supply literally overnight. Um, the second big change that we had at Manpower Group is, like many of you watching today, we shifted to 90% remote work, again, overnight, realizing decades of investment in technology that we hadn't been fully leveraging, um, but thank goodness we made the investment. We realized that overnight as well, so significant shift into into remote work. And the, the last point I would make is we saw a real um, unleashing of leadership and so, you know, we're in people's homes now every day. You're in my home today. So we have this um, new visibility into how our people not just do their work, but how they live their life and do their work. And that has caused a, a change in leadership to one that's really led um, with authenticity, um, even more so than ever. Uh, lots of communication has been required and just really embracing the role that people play outside of the workplace, because now work is wherever, you know, our employees happen to sit. That is such an important point about us being in the homes of millions now. Well, I guess each of us are in the homes of a few dozen or a few hundred people. But the fact that we've drilled into these millions of homes now, it's a reminder that you can't always have one size fits all responses to different challenges and problems because we're just all all so different. I guess my question to both of you as uh, leaders in global organizations, how much have you had to balance the need for sort of standard global responses to a challenge that affects all of us versus localized responses for local circumstance? Yeah, let Maybe me jump in jump? here because um, it, the um, yeah what, what we saw early on was this the fact that globally we were all going to deal with the same crisis, but we were dealing on different schedules and under different circumstances. So globally, our leaders, uh, as we conducted ongoing crisis team meetings, really made the conscious decision not to try to command and control things globally. We realized that as long as we could articulate to people the priorities, right, here's what we expect of leaders across the, the corporation, you know, taking care of employees first, and by the way, hand in hand, with taking care of the business because we don't have one without the other. And uh, and so then pushing decision-making out. And in that whole uh, process of empowerment, what we discovered is leaders we just never knew were capable of stepping up to the challenge, leading locally, making great decisions on behalf of the corporation, and making sure we really performed at our utmost in very difficult circumstances. Can I, right. I How about add, you, Becky? Yeah, I'll, I'll add, Ryan. Um, so we're we're fortunate to operate in 80 countries around the world. And so we tracked, literally tracked the virus and the impact on, you know, society and community as it went in waves. We called it tracking the wave. And so that helped us understand, OK, what is impacted first? How do we get ahead of this? Where is, you know, where are we seeing the trend move next? So I would say in that res- that part of your um, response to your question, there was a global view of how is this virus impacting you know communities and jobs, and we all know that there's different infrastructure around the world, but it had some commonality when you shut down an, an, an economy. The impacts of that can be somewhat predicted, and so we learned from that to so try to ready ourselves for the next the next place it was coming. But in terms of the localization, you know, talent in many cases is deployed locally. Um, in many cases, people have to go to a physical place. And so there was a real local reaction. Um, human beings live in a certain location, particularly those um, that have to show up at work every day. And so when I talked about the hotel chain, 
it was so interesting to me um, because it, people tend to talk in their title and in their degree and in their background versus speaking about this is the impact that I can have on companies. This is the type of work that I do, the skills that I bring. And that really was the local unlock for us is to say, forget about your title or where your degree is in, but what are your capabilities and how do we showcase those capabilities in a totally new way? And so we saw it truly as, as the, the next phase of the skills revolution where we have people with skills that are in demand and those with skills that are declining in demand. And our job as a global, you know, as a global community is to ensure everyone has a place to contribute. And so we saw an acceleration of this skills revolution and, and how we enable not just the white collar workers to work remotely and have flexibility, but also the blue collar workers. And so what does that look like if you have to show up at a job site every day? Well, it looks like flexing the commute. You know, we, we spend a lot of time commuting and it's one of the gifts of the crisis that workers will tell you around the world that they've benefited from is reclaiming their commute. And so flex the start time, even if you're in a manufacturing site or on a job site. So there are ways to add flexibility locally, even outside of completely re uh, remote working. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating there, where at one level it, it feels like we can now be blind to titles and all other factors, and it's just about the capabilities. And then at another level, I worry that uh, we're kind of locked into the networks or the relationships and hierarchies that we had the day things locked down in the case of, of people who are having to, to work remotely. Um, do you think that there's elements of, of both that we're going to have to try and uh, acknowledge and work through, um, or, or are there other things that I'm forgetting about entirely there? Yeah, so Ryan, I'll just continue that answer. Um, it has been, we have done things remotely that were believed couldn't happen. Closing financial books. I, I don't know anywhere in the world if that's ever been done completely remotely. In fact, people would probably tell you, you know, at the end of the quarter, there's no way that you can do that. Well, guess what? We've all done it, not just my company. It's, it's we're all closing the books in a different way. Um, collaboration has taken on a new level. And so the I, I was on a, a panel a while ago and someone said, hey, the great thing about video conferencing is all the boxes are the same size. So it has a huge impact on both diversity, but also on voices being heard. Like it's not about hierarchy, it's about what do you have to contribute to the conversation. And so I agree, one of the early concerns was, hey, what happens to networking and you know the water cooler talk that people talk about? Um, we're just having that happen in a whole new way and maybe on a more equal playing field than it had happened prior. Um, we, we did to do some research that I was sharing with you prior um, to this call, Ryan, around this is showing up differently across generations. You know, we surveyed 8,000 workers around the world to understand what they wanted from the future of work. And by generation, there's some differences. And so the Gen Zs of the world are most positive about coming back into the workplace. And one of the primary drivers is they, they leverage it for networking and for friendships. And whereas you have boomers and, and Gen Xs that are more for the separation of work and home, and that's been a little bit of a challenge in this environment. And you have millennials that are most of the young parents that really are happy about working remotely because it lets them flex their home life and their work life and truly bring it together as one life. So we are seeing some differences across generation. Um, but for the most part, we've seen collaboration networking um, done in a whole different way, actually achieve some new levels of success. Yeah, I, I couldn't about, agree more, about, Becky. It, yeah, it's this has been really interesting to see a very rapid evolution. We're hearing from leaders all over the place that their digital transformation has happened far faster than they ever expected. You know, think about all the things we do today that maybe a year ago we wouldn't have considered a virtual doctor's appointment, et cetera. And, and at the beginning, I noticed people were asking the question, how can I do the equivalent of something I used to do in person virtually? But there's another layer of question to ask, which is, what can I do now that I could never do before? And I'll give you an example. Um, we used to send technicians out in a group, a project team, to support a power plant that was made through a massive maintenance outage. You know, a, a group of people would descend, they would work together side by side uh, to get through whatever diagnosis and then repairs that needed to be done. Well, now what we can do is send in a very small team with equipped with some virtual reality technology. And now an expert somewhere in the world can be tapped into that visit 
and can be supporting with truly the best knowledge we have available. That one expert can now service multiple teams at once. These are things that weren't even possible before. So what I'm encouraging to the, the team to think about is, right, if you could do things completely differently, what would it look like? And, you know, it's, we don't need to just think in terms of how can I do something that I used to do in person? Now, just finally, on the subject of um, networking, I do think we have to be very be conscious of it and intentional. I'm really encouraging people on my team to not hesitate to give me a text, you know, do a ping, the equivalent of a walk by, you know, dropping by the office. And then in reverse, I'm reaching out. Um, I've started scheduling one on one meetings with employees all across the organization. They're called tell me anything meetings. You know, hey, here's a half hour. Let's get together. And I just want to hear what's on your mind. Because I think right now feeling connected may be one of the most important things we need. I can only back that thought up so much about imagining what uh, we can do that we didn't think was possible before. To give you just one example from the world of journalism, one of the big criticisms of political journalism in recent years is that it is too based in the, the big coastal capital cities, that it hasn't fairly reflected and hasn't dived into the lives of people across America. And that was a challenge for media outlets as they've struggled to maintain revenues with the digital revolution. And what this pandemic allowed us to do was recognize that we have reporters from virtually all 50 states. And by encouraging them to spend some time back home, and some of them even decided to move back to their uh, original locations rather than live in Washington or another city like that, We've been able to live in those communities and bring stories from those communities that is cheaper than making people travel back just for two or three days. And it's more authentic as well because it's recognizing what those people were bringing to the table in the first place instead of trying to fit them into some particular business model or narrative about what a big national media outlet is supposed to be. So and you've just made me think about that in, in a new light. So I'm, I'm glad to reflect on that. Um, I'll get back to a question. That's my job in this process. Um, I was talking yesterday with one of the vice presidents at the European Union, and he was talking to me that telling me that one of the biggest lessons he had in trying to manage uncertainty in the, the this crisis was that you need to be more sustainable and you need to try and make your supply chains shorter if you can can do that. I'm not sure that that's exactly true equally between goods-based businesses or service businesses, but I wanted to, to check in on that front. What have been your tactics for reducing uncertainty in what is obviously a, a very uncertain time? Yeah, Becky, you want to start? Yeah. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I'd say first, we've tried to flip that question on its head because while we do work closely with putting you know people to work around the world, we work with a lot of clients and customers you know, in the in the um, various countries as well. And one of the things we, we've faced this exact question, by the way, like, how do we navigate this kind of uncertainty? How do we build resilience? And we've encouraged them to flip that question on its head. How do you prepare for the new next? Because guess what? Everybody's talking about skills moving at the pace of technology prior to the crisis where we're living it now. And so it's really a mindset change of how do you prepare for the new next? And I, I encourage my organization now, we don't talk about the new normal because what is new normal? It's about new next. And guess what? There'll be another new next after this one. And so I think it's the mindset shift of, okay, what is your true north in the midst of change? And what we've held to and what we've encouraged our clients to hold to is what was your original purpose and what are your values? We've all had to make some very challenging decisions. You know, what do we invest in? How do we keep people working during this crisis? And what has been our true north is our purpose and our values, which again is to, to find people meaningful and sustainable employment. And that means for us being agile, adapting to this new idea of, okay, so a, a customer service representative may have had this title, but what's the work that they did so we can help redeploy them and to keep them working? And so I think that would be the first thing is it's really about constantly readying yourself for new next. And we have an amazing opportunity to reduce the fear that people have of change because we're all living in change today. So not just a piece of the organization is going through change. Change is surrounding us, changes our life right now, whether it's your home life, whether it's online remote school or whether it's your work. 
We're all living in the midst of change. And so how do you keep your value centered and help people navigate change? And I loved hearing from Barbara how she's having these open conversations, because my guess is that's part of Siemens culture is we're going to have transparency and authenticity. It's also part of Manpower Group's culture. So I've been doing something similarly um, because people don't want to feel like they have to do something for you. They just want to feel like they care, that you care about what they're doing. And so that's really been, you know, stay true to your purpose, remind yourself of your values and use that as the true north to prepare, not just for the crisis and react, but for the new next that's going to come faster than ever, even after this crisis. Yeah, new next. That's a cool concept. Um, you know, it's funny because I've been using the phrase the now normal. You know, it's changing so fast that what do we need right now is the question, you know, I want everybody to feel comfortable with. Um, and, and actually there's a term I, I learned about a year ago. Um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, the author of The Black Swan, et cetera, he wrote a book called Anti-Fragile. And you, what is anti-fragile? Well, he did an extensive study uh, looking for a word that represented the opposite of fragile, something that is broken by disruption. And and he found there's no language in the world with the word. You know, we can talk resilience. We can talk about recovery. We can. But those are all about sort of maintaining the status quo. And he asked the question, what about things that get stronger from disruption? And an example of that is our muscles. When we work them out, we disrupt them. And then, you know, in the moment, our muscles respond. And then over a period of days or weeks, in my case, they recover. Um, and then, in essence, they reinvent. What they say is, I'm going to be stronger so that next time I'm not going to get hurt that way. And, and so what we've been focused on is, can we be an anti-fragile business? Well, can we take this moment of disruption and turn it into a personal training session that actually makes us stronger for the future. So everyone has a role to play in this, right? The, the supply chain experts, Ryan, you know, you mentioned early on that, hey, we were dependent on goods moving around the world and, and we needed supplies in order to fulfill our mission for our customers here. And our supply chain team, they were heroes in the moment, making sure we found alternative sorts of supply rerouting. And then, as I say, our manufacturing experts helping participants in the supply chain overcome barriers of their own. These are the kind of things that can get us to be anti-fragile. And, and I've been sharing one, one, one concept that I think could be very valuable for the future. At Siemens, we are experts in industrial questions, and we're familiar with today's tools, which a lot of people may not even be aware of. And one I'll call the digital twin. You'll hear it discussed all over the place as how can we use digital tools today to help in manufacturing resilience? And, and a concept I have is, hey, rather than creating physical stockpiles of items that we may need for some crisis someday, what if we maintained the digital twins, the, the virtual replicas of things that we might need to use in the future? Maintain those digital twins as a stockpile, a, a strategic digital twin reserve, and then combining that with flexible manufacturers who are able to pick up these designs and manufacture on demand, we can actually be better prepared to respond to whatever crisis in the future. So using know-how from all parts of the organization. We're focused on how do we come be how do we become even stronger because of the disruption we're facing today? I love that idea. It's like the manufacturing equivalent of a seed bank to protect us in the event of you know the the annihilation scenarios. But that's a little bit too negative. Let's stay you positive. Got it. That's exactly um, right. Yes. Um, th thinking uh, on that same line, but a little more broadly now. Uh, one topic or one set of topics that I think about a lot is resilience and sustainability. And I've always tried to tell people that sustainability isn't just the green, you know, that there's the, the concept of ESG, so environment, social and governance. It's, it's a lot broader there. Um, I wanted to explore those topics a little bit with you. How, how, have you, how has your understanding of sustainability changed in the pandemic now that we see all of these other social inputs and problems that, that we all have some obligation to address. 
That's right. We're seeing that this is all tied together, right? This is all linked. And in 2015, I, I really think that the United Nations did a fantastic job of articulating 17 sustainable development goals for the planet. And Siemens has gotten to work on all 17, but we actually play a huge role in several of them. Yeah, think about clean power. Think about you know access to food and water. Think about gender equality. These are all things that Siemens has been able to work on in, in a very, I'll say, first-person way. Um, and, and I think what we've seen as the wave first of the coronavirus leading to the economic crisis that we're dealing with, leading to, you know, really uncovering some of the underlying social issues that exist in our country, we've seen that it requires the uh, a, a true um, integrated focus in order to responsibly address these. And, you know, business is part of the fabric of our society. So many people are looking to government right now to solve problems. And I would say to you, businesses like ours are, I mean, Becky, I'm, I'll be curious to hear how you feel about this, but I feel like we have a responsibility to step up and lead on these topics. So whether it is in fact, you know, obviously, sustainability with energy efficiency across all of our product portfolio, a transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy, and the management of that transition. Um, Siemens has deep expertise there. That's powerful and important, but what's every bit as important is considering all of the stakeholders within the businesses, the markets, the countries that we serve. And um, I, I just I believe it, particularly now, I believe the societal aspects are going to be some of the most important we, we deal with over the coming months and years. Mm-hmm. How and about I you, would, Becky? I would add. Um, yeah, I would add a, a, a little different perspective, which this crisis has ushered in the dawn of human and talent sustainability. And so, yes, of course, we believe in environmental sustainability, but there's a new element that now the world is talking about which is talent sustainability. How do we make sure that we have, you know, we close the skills gap between the haves and the have nots and make sure that human beings can continue to learn and contribute. And and that's very exciting. And so, you know, one of the gifts of the crisis has been helping people redefine themselves and making sure that they can continue working. And and that is a huge element of talent sustainability. Uh, Another gift has been companies realizing, Barbara, to your exact point, the responsibility, the responsibility we have to invest in people's learning and development. And so talent is a, a gift. And so we have to continue nurturing it. And that has been, um, you know, the, the conversations we're having now are unlike the conversations a year ago, which everybody was talking about upskilling and reskilling. That's not a new concept. There was talk without action. Now we're seeing that shift into action. How do we develop our talent pool? You know, the days of a spot market for talent where I'm going to go into the marketplace and find the skill, those days are gone because skills are changing so quickly. We have to all develop the talent that we have. And and Barbara, I couldn't agree more. That is a call to action by um, businesses. And it's a call to action for partnerships between private and public enterprise and our educational system. You know, I have three daughters. They're all Gen Z. Um, 65% of the jobs that they will face when they graduate university don't exist today. 65% of the jobs my daughters will face don't exist today. So it begs the question of, okay, so what, what is the role of teaching in a university? And so I, I tell my kids all the time, your job is to learn how to learn because that's what your future holds is learning. Yeah, you've just made me think that this is a kind of very positive blurring of some of the lines that we had just become comfortable with uh, in the past, in the sense that maybe there were in the past some issues we thought, well, that's just for government to address or it's too political for a corporation to get involved in. But with all of these boundaries blurring and with our lives becoming so complex, if we don't integrate all of it, it does feel like uh, we're going to be missing a trick. Um, is, is that a, a sort of sentiment you'd both agree with or is, is there something I'm missing there? Oh, yeah, indeed. So, so I would just we say, are Ryan, dealing with oh, that. I, I would just say we knew. So we've known for probably 18 months now that workers expect work to play a bigger role in their well-being. And talking about blurring lines, like no one was talking about that except workers saying that it's not just about giving me pay and security and benefits. 
You should have a role in making sure I have well-being and not just health. I'm talking about mental well-being, physical well-being, sustainable wages. And that is um, this idea that work contributes to well-being and that workers want one life. So they want this blend versus separate lives. They want this blend of work and home. And they believe that work should contribute to home and home should contribute to work. And so, you know, this crisis has only accelerated what we were seeing, you know, 12 to 18 months ago. And so the, the, the real question is, as employers start to reopen around the world and come back to work, how do you bridge those two worlds, this home and, and work world? Workplace and workforce are now separated. So do we all go back into the office? Is that the plan? On the voice of American workers would tell you that they don't want to work remote. Most people don't want to work remote full time, but they do want the flexibility to work remote a couple of days a week. And again, why is that? because it contributes to their well-being and their one life between work and home. So that the blurring of the lines, um, I actually think it's the joining of the worlds versus the blurring of the lines. And I think that can only be positive for workers and for employers. And it really brings trust front and center on both parties. It sure does, Becky. And, um, you know, Siemens, by the way, has announced uh, globally that we're going to be expecting folks to be spending two to three days in the office on an ongoing basis. And that that means we focus more on outcomes than on time spent in front of a manager. It's a real call to action for managers to think differently about how they manage their employees. And, and we'll be taking a close look at that because we're looking for leaders who will get it and who will thrive in that environment. But it's interesting because not everything is comfortable about this conversation. Um, what we're dealing with now, if there was ever, you know, before, if there was a crisp line between the workplace and home, it also allowed us, I think, to reinforce some unconscious bias, keep some things rolling that, oh, it's just the way we've always done things. And Right now, we're questioning everything. How do we become more inclusive, more equitable? And part of that is bringing some of these conversations into the workplace. And I'll share with you, you know, the employees aren't really, not every employee is thrilled about this kind of conversation now happening. I actually got a call from a manager who had a manufacturing site, has a manufacturing site, and he said, Barb, you know, our workforce used to get along so well. And now that we're having what you're calling courageous conversations, bringing up the real issues we're dealing with about opportunity and equality, it's um, it's causing some stress, stress and pressure in the organization. We have internal social media where we encourage people to speak up. And in fact, some people have posted things that have been on the edge of appropriate. I'll put it that way. And, and the question folks will ask me is, well, aren't we going to edit that out? Are you going to take down posts? And so far, I don't feel that anyone has, you know, crossed a line in which, which would cause us to take something down. They've done some things where we've reached out to them one on one and said, did you think about this before you put it up? And some people have edited themselves, taken their own posts down. But what I'm trying to do is foster a moment where we, feel it's appropriate to talk about the hard issues, get things out on the table that haven't been said so far, and then show that we're we're confident enough in our own capabilities to allow people to speak up and then seek to understand one another and then build an action plan based on what we perceive as the best thing for the business and and the welfare of our employees. So I realize, you know, I know that Becky and I, we're, we're cut from the same cloth. We're optimistic. So we can sound really um, upbeat about where we are right now. And let there be no mistake. There's some stuff about this that is hard, tough, and I'll say, yeah, really gut-wrenching for some folks in our organization. I think... That's absolutely something true in our own organization, that Politico, where you see a real confidence and assertion, particularly among the younger employees now, in trying to talk about those conversations because they do see all of these connections between their work and, and their personal lives. And it's unsettling for some of the, the, the older people in the organization because they're used to doing things a certain way. Uh, and younger people might not have the titles, um, but they're definitely using this moment to assert themselves by saying, no, we, we care about these conversations and we're going to, to have them regardless. So I would fully back you up on that point. 
Um, now, we've got a question coming in from the audience, um, so let me put this one to you, um, but it's, it's largely in line with what we were talking about. And the question was, what trainings do you think employers need to be giving uh, to help people adjust to this new next, the new normal, um, and how they're going through all of this change? And that's a question to both of you. I'll, I'll start, Barbara. I was looking to see if you were going to start talking about, you know, the, the challenges and learnings of a digital environment. Um, so great question. So first, thank you for the question. You know, so I'm going to take it in two parts. So we did some research probably a year and a half ago around the role of a digital leader. So this is pre-crisis. Everyone's talking about the pace of technology, the digital twin architect that Barbara mentioned. We did some work around that as well. Um, the, the other gift of the crisis we haven't mentioned, by the way, whole new jobs have emerged. At six months ago, the term temperature checker was not a term, like that would be the nurse checks your temperature at the doctor, but now their jobs were staffing around temperature checkers. Their jobs were staffing at the intersection of tech and healthcare and manufacturing that are around COVID testers, you know, so people who can come in and, and both manufacture as well as administer COVID tests. And so I just wanted to make note, there's there's been another gift to the crisis. But in terms of the digital leader, what, we're, what our research discovered is that 80% of the character traits that make a leader effective remain. Curiosity, learnability, things like that remain. The 20% that is new is truly around unleashing talent, the ability to take risks that are informed, and the courage to do so. And so the 20% is new for the digital leader. And so then you say, okay, well, those are more soft skills. Yes. So the other thing we discovered that soft skills are, are increasingly playing a role that is equal to that of hard skills. And why is that? It goes back to the lesson I, I shared with my children. Your job in college is to learn how to learn. And that's what we're seeing emerge in terms of soft skills to unleash the capability in others. Um, there was a study done by one of the major institutions that basically said the role of the CEO is, is gone. It's outdated. They don't hold the knowledge anymore to make the decisions. And I think that is particularly how American companies grew up is you grow up in an organization, you, lo you learn various roles, and then you run the organization. And therefore, you've done the most, you have the best perspective, you make the decisions. Well, Ryan, back to what you said about young people, we are seeing a disaggregation now of that decision making where the people that hold the knowledge may be two, three, five levels below the CEO. And the CEO then becomes a conduit of, do I know who to go to? to get the best counsel who's closest to the information and bring that forward. And so I would say that's another piece of learnability is making sure that you know who to go to. The idea that one person holds all the information is an outdated concept. We have to leverage all those around us. And then the last thing I would say around um, how we should be upskilling and training people is in pieces. And so we develop pathways. So we have a process to help people move through pathways of where jobs may be declining in demand to where they're increasing in demand. So it could be a six week program that you do online while you're continuing to work. It could be an eight week program next that takes you to the next level. And so it's all about shifting people from areas that are declining in demand to areas that are increasing in demand. And there's a huge diversity impact there because guess what? You know, we, we talk about the wage gap between, between uh, men and women. And one of the challenges that we're facing with technology is the jobs that we know will be disrupted are disproportionately represented by women. And so we really have to think about reducing that pay gap and that diversity gap. And one way to do that is pathways that are just in time, not going back to get another four year degree, but just in time pathways that help you move towards the job that you want that will continue to be in demand in the future. And so I would say soft skills investment is important. You know, digital leadership is truly around soft skills and unleashing talent making sure that you know what you don't know and going and finding people who know that information. And then finally, short bursts of training that help people keep current skills because skills are the new currency and that's what will keep people employable in the future. Becky's absolutely right. And this is such an exciting time because we are shifting from that idea that the only pathway to the American dream is with a four-year college degree um, it's so obvious now that what matters is the contribution you could make to uh, to a company or to your community. So uh, we have some shorthand for the way we talk about the skills we're looking for in leaders in particular, IQ, EQ, and DQ. IQ, we, uh, people need to technically know the, the job that they're expected to perform in. EQ, that ability to empathize to to uh, to reach others and lead through 
um, you know, not through position power, but through acclimation. And then the the idea of DQ, we call it a disruption or a digital quotient. That's someone who is willing to embrace the new tools of today. Those are the three quotients that we're looking for in a leader. And a few years ago, Siemens started, um, you know, in terms of this question of what training should we provide? We actually um, in, administered what we called a digital checklist. A, a, you could do a self-assessment of your own capabilities. And, you know, so through taking a test and understanding where your strengths and weaknesses are, then we could serve up modular training to help close gaps. So if somebody wanted to learn more about a particular area, data analytics or cybersecurity, they could. And so I, I do think that we're at a moment where they're the only thing holding people back are curiosity and initiative. Take a look at what uh, colleges and universities are doing today. They are managing to make their knowledge accessible through many courses um, online. We can all get access to the best and brightest. And then by, by following our own curiosity, collecting the credentials, and then being able to share those with employers, then, you know, we really can drive the transition we want to see in our own careers. Now, we're getting towards the end of the conversation, so I wanted to, to turn it inwards a little bit for a moment of personal reflection, and I agree to go first uh, to make it more comfortable. Uh, when I think about what lessons I learned about myself this year was that uh, it's been great to sort of re-own or, or retool the commute. I do a little bit of exercise in the morning, and I, I learned that I'm a better person when I've done some of that exercise in the morning. I've also learned I'm not as good at switching off as I thought I was. And so there is a blurring of boundaries issues for me in the evening. I'm not great at that. Uh, so I wanted to ask each of you um, what you've personally learned through um, the crisis and, and who are you learning from in 2020? Go ahead. Maybe Mark. let's start with you. Ben. Oh, you want to start with me? Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's interesting, Ryan. I had, um, I had a call one time where someone, one of the people that works for me said, how did you learn how to lead through a pandemic? And I was like, are you kidding? Like, I don't know how to lead through a pandemic. Who knows how to do that? What I learned <laughs> is that I just have to be myself. And when I know something, I say I know it. And when I don't, I say I don't. And when I need help, I ask for it. And so this idea of, of showing up authentically, like on steroids, like truly being vulnerable and telling people, I, I, I had, I said something in passing one day on a, on one of the big calls that we had. And I said, about every 10 days, I have a mini meltdown. And that, you know, and I wasn't planning to say that, but guess what? It's true. About every 10 days, I was sitting in the same position every day, having, you know, video calls, nine, 10 hours a day. And I was drained and it just was too much. And I couldn't go to the grocery store. I mean, it was a, it was a crazy time period right in the front of the crisis. And I'd have a little mini meltdown. And I had to check myself and do some, you know, okay, I need to start, restart my exercise program. I need to reclaim my commute, Ryan. And so instead of driving to work now, I'll walk around the block. Or I'll sit on the porch and have a cup of coffee with my husband and my dogs. You know, so what are those rituals that get me set up for my day? So I, I did learn that I, I have to do my own reset and that by sharing that with my organization, huge impact. People are like, oh my gosh, if she can have, you know, mini meltdowns, then we can too. Like this is okay. And so it was the affirmation that we're not just business leaders anymore. We're not just, you know, talent people leaders anymore. We are all of that because we're going into people's homes. We're meeting their children. Their, their children are hearing how we interact with each other. Like we're shaping the definition of, of the future of work and relationships every day. And, and so that, you know, that's a little of what I learned about myself. I have to give myself, you know, some grace in the moment of, of stress because it has been a very, very stressful um, transition. And because it's not going away, you have to then adapt rituals so that you can, you can, um, sustain. And so to your question, Ryan, on who I'm learning from, I am a student of everyone around me. And so if something is working for someone's so this whole idea of reclaiming the commute, somebody said that to me and I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I need to do. Cause what did the commute do for me before? So how do I, how do I now implement new rituals in my, to start my day and to finish my day? And the other thing you said, Ryan, around, you're not as good at, at unplugging. 
Um, we're working all kinds of hours now because people know like, well, it's after six, but she just turned off her video camera. So she's probably still there. So I'll call her or I think the same for my people. And so I'm, I'm really trying now in the next phase of, of the new next to create some boundaries. And the last thing I would say is um, instead of doing to do lists, because, you know, I'm, I'm am type A, I like to make those check marks. But instead of doing to do lists, I'm really trying to think about to be lists. So what do I want to be as we emerge from this crisis? And what do I want the organization to be? And everyone can do that. You don't have to be a leader to create a to-be list because you are managing your own world and your own life. And so that, that would be the parting lesson I've learned is I was very focused on all the things I had to do. And I was losing sight of all the things I want myself and my organization to be. That is a very good answer. I really hope someone's clipping it and sharing it straight away. Barbara, sorry to leave you in the follow-up <laughs> position there, but what, 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 what's your response? <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm inspired by that. Um, early on in the pandemic, I got invited to be part of a project called Resilient Leadership. And the, the idea of this was that the project leader would uh, call once a week uh, over a period of about 12 weeks and there were six folks from business and another six folks from the chief resilience officers from major cities around the world. And, and this was an in the moment reflection on how are we dealing with the crisis? And there's something really powerful about being aware that we are, it, we are in a crisis. We are acting. We're making decisions. And, and each week it caused me to think about what is happening this week? And what are we doing at Siemens to, to, to be who we want to be? I'll say to use Becky's term. Um, and, and so then each week, as I would meet with the leader, the power of that, not only reflection, but then his feedback to me really spurred new action. So um, advice I would give to folks, first, go to the Resilience Shift Project, and you'll see the collection of these interviews and the lessons learned. It's it's interesting to see how things have evolved from beginning through middle to new middle to we're not done yet. <laughs> and and um, but at the same time, in your own um, in your own personal network, Think about that person who you can go to for an ongoing reflection and um, and thought process, maybe some coaching and counseling, because you'll be amazed at what is in you as you confront things you've never dealt with before. And, sh and the mere act of sharing it with somebody else, talking it through can be incredibly powerful in cementing new lessons. Great. Now, maybe one tiny follow up. We've got a couple of minutes left before the next session. It's looking forward now. Um, and I definitely don't want us to end on a negative note, but I do want to flag that we had uh, some terrible times earlier in the year. Going to be coming back to winter. We're transitioning out of the nice summer months, at least in the northern hemisphere. So they could be challenging times ahead. Um, is there anything that you want the audience to know or any advice you want them to have um, as they we move out of the nice warm summer months where we've had a little bit of relax um, and where things might get tough again? Yeah, think ahead, right? Look over the horizon. Think about what you may need when conditions are different, when we can't just opt to do everything outside. And then and then think through what are going to be the things that you need to have on hand. Is there anything that needs to be prepared now? We're squirrels getting ready for the winter. And I would say um, communication, communication, communication. Like be your own advocate. Tell people what you need from them. If you need to take a day, take a day. You know, one of the things in the crisis that's concerning me the most is people aren't taking their vacation time because they can't leave to go somewhere. So they feel like because I can't go on a trip, therefore I won't take vacation. And I think we have to be taking care of ourselves. Um, you know, as I said, we're not just leaders of work now. We're leaders of lives. And we have to be very understanding of what's happening in people's lives. And the only way to do that is communication. And, you know, Barbara said it well. A lot of this is uncomfortable. You know, because I mean, we're running businesses. So how do you do that? We run businesses through people. And so we have to keep people first. You have to keep yourself and your mental and physical health first. And as we, if we go into tougher times, let's go in stronger 
um, more anti-fragile. Barbara, I love that term, more anti-fragile. And so that we can, we know the work processes and what we need to do for rituals um, to be life leaders versus just business and people leaders. Becky, thank you so much. Barbara, thank you as well. I feel like I have learned a lot. I wish I'd been taking notes. I shouldn't have been the moderator. I should have been a participant in this discussion. And it's really great to have that sort of constructive space where you, you feel like you're learning something and not just sort of headbutting a challenge, new challenge every single day, um, like we have been over the past six months. So you've been listening to Barbara Humpton, President and Chief Executive Officer of Siemens Corporation here in North America, and Becky Frankowitz, President of Manpower Group North America. Thank you both. Thank you everyone for watching, and uh, we hope you enjoy what comes next.